Portland is well known for being a coffee city. With the country's sixth highest number of cafes per capita, opening up a coffee shop in Portland means entering a competitive scene with some of the best roasters in the industry. And while Portland is notorious for its coffee, it's also well known for its lack of diversity. Historically, coffee shop owners and master roasters have tended to be white, making it difficult to enter the coffee scene as a person of color or as an immigrant. The few BIPOC roasters in Portland, however, are breaking the mold and bringing their experiences, values, and culture to their shops. For Ian Williams, creating Deadstock Coffee was more about creating a snob-free space for people to talk about sneakers than it was about making fancy coffee. My name is Nori Cherry and I'm a barista at Deadstock Coffee. It started from people who didn't like coffee. So the owner, Ian, didn't like coffee. I didn't know anything about coffee. I was just a young kid who liked sweet drinks. All of the homies were like, eh, coffee, I guess. And a lot of people were like, eh. I'm not used to coffee, this third wave coffee. You know, we get a lot of people who are from communities that coffee isn't taught to or coffee isn't told like, hey, come be a part of this. So, you know, black and brown communities, you know, they're kind of like, you know, it's, it's more standoffish of a thing. So we wanted to make sure that we did stuff that was for them specifically. If you don't know about roasting, if you don't know about beans, if you don't know about milk, espresso machines, grinders, all these different tools that we have to use, you're gonna have a rough time because all the other shops know about it. Understanding that you had to be at these events to get access to all this stuff is kind of where Ian developed the snob free idea because he was going to all these events as a young black male. And a lot of people were like, eh, like, who are you? Like, ah, like, what, 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 what are you doing with us? Like, you know, like kind of, you know, very standoffish very insider outsider like i don't know about you i don't know what you do every so often of course you would come across people who were like hey come on over here we'll show you what we know we'll, you know and like that type of behavior that snob free behavior is really what made him be like i couldn't have done it without these people that were like that to me so he understood that when people come in here we don't want them to feel the way he did at those events it gets more and less pretentious because People are developing a craft, but at the same time, it's like you're serving customers. You're dealing with food service, customer service, and it's very important that when somebody comes in, they feel appreciated, heard, you know. You look at our neighborhood, you know, no person in this neighborhood wants to be treated like they're less than because a lot of them already are. Growing up in China, Zhou Young had never drank coffee. It wasn't until a term studying abroad in Australia that Zhou tasted his first cup. The whole experience sparked a fascination that would eventually land him the first place prize in the 2020 United States Roaster Championship. I know the Portland is the is the most famous this coffee city in the world, not just in the United States, in the world. So I think I have to go there. Yeah. My name is Joe Yang. I'm from the, the Hefei. It's pretty close to Shanghai. I, I didn't know any, anyone before I come here. It's, for me, it's like a brand new city. So the so first thing is I just learned how to speak English. Yeah, because I know in coffee shop, communication is the best part. It's hard to find the, the good location from the landlord because they will check your background. You will check your, do you have a business background in the United States? Because even I have a business background in China, but it, that doesn't mean anything because it's a different country. I have Chinese coffee every year. I would love to let more people to try the coffee from China. I got a lot of customers say, oh, this is my first time to try the real Chinese coffee. They said, oh, really? Chinese has coffee? I say, yeah, China actually is uh, the number nine largest uh, the, the Arabica coffee producer country. That moment I really enjoyed is uh, 
It's a, the, the customer, you know, they got my coffee and they take a sip. They said, wow, that's the best coffee in the world. Or whatever, best coffee in my life. You know, that moment you really touch your heart. So I feel, yes. Unlike Joe, Hector Mejia began drinking coffee at the age of three. Raised on his family's coffee farm in Guatemala, coffee wasn't just a part of a morning routine. It was how his family survived. Unfortunately, the interest in coffee never happened until my father passed away, which honestly is something that I regret not being able to have early on to interact with him. But at least that has been a way for me to get to connect and, and get to know more about my father's uh, life and interest. My name is Hector Mejia. I'm from Guatemala. In Guatemala, there was an internal civil war that lasted from 1955 to 1996. And in the 80s, my parents came here uh, to the States and my siblings were born here and that's how my father made money to buy land in Guatemala and get his own farm. It took me one year to uh, realize that Portland was a coffee city. I didn't move to Portland thinking about making a business out of coffee. I realized that if I was to do good here, then I could bring coffee from Guatemala and find a way to have a direct sell to people which was what my father wanted. At least that was a dream. But uh, once reality hit, I realized that coffee here is very saturated. It's a very saturated market. It's very competitive. People are already used to receiving more than what they are giving. And I was looking for something different. So once I got the opportunity to open up the shop, I started talking to people, explaining how we were not only serving coffee from people that we knew, but it was our own coffee. But once people took the time, pretty much because of the pandemic, people started knowing about us. People started understanding that, oh, there are way more details behind what goes into coffee than what we thought. First, it was only my farm. And once we started selling more, and now that we are selling more, we have been able to get more farmers involved. We have this educational program in which we teach them about finances, budgeting, projections, elasticity of the business, how they can reinvest their money, how they can create wealth. When you put people first, then that, that's when you really get to get a real political statement that can change a community. So we have realized and we have been very aware of that we are not going to change the coffee industry. We are going to change, at least, our community's reality by focusing our efforts in that specific community.